three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's Steve with Real Progressives, and we are having our weekly slot with our good friend and economist, Ellis Winningham. This week's subject will be on the national debt, uh, federal financing, and quite frankly, macroeconomic reality. Let me welcome my guest, Ellis Winningham. Welcome to the program, sir. How are you tonight? Hello, Mr. Cromby. So, I'm fine. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you a question, man, because, you know, I'm going to play the role of Joe Q. Public. I am mm -hmm. going to talk as the many followers of Real Progressives, and I'm just going to come right out and ask you, man, I watched this big thing on the TV, this national debt clock, and it is spinning like crazy. I'm telling you what, they're really big numbers, Alice. I mean, really, really big numbers. What do we do with the really big numbers? What's going on with that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, let's just give up, hope, and die. <laughs> I, I'll check the, let me check. Let me check the uh, the Catechism of the Book of Orthodoxy here. It says, uh, Chapter Two. Yes, when confronted by questions concerning the national debt, tell the questioner we're all going to die. So yes, we're all going to die. <laughs> There's no hope. We're doomed. Just forget yeah. it. It's a lot of money. We owe China. We owe China lots of money, Steve. Can't make it. We're going to die. We're all going to die. Mm -hmm. Obama so, so, just breaking that handle on the printing press. China's coming for the rent check, Stephen, and we ain't got it. Damn. So scared. What about so, my hog farm? You know what? What now? <laughs> so, what well, you've got most of our friends out there in the audience who have been inundated with Ron Paul's stuff. They've been introduced to Peter Schiff and the Goldbug late night infomercials. They've been told that the debt is coming, man. The economic collapse is coming. They're worrying about our debt. They're talking about how China owns most of the United States because of the debt. We're scared, Ellis. We're petrified. What do we do? What's going on? Talk to me about what that really means to the rest of the world. Okay. Stephen, can I ask you a question? Most certainly. Do you have a savings account or do you know someone who does? I have a savings account. It's pretty depleted right now, to be honest with you. But you have one. Yeah, I do indeed. Uh, yes, sir. Are you afraid of it? I'm afraid of it not having enough in it, but I'm not afraid of it. No. Okay, that's great. Most people aren't frightened of savings accounts. And you know what else? So what else? The thing is, is that what people are not being told is all the national debt really is, is a bunch of savings accounts at the Federal Reserve that pay interest. It's not a debt. If someone comes to you and says, the national debt is $20 trillion, then ask them, is that Canadian dollars? And if they say, no, that's US dollars, simply say to them, Oh, thank God. For a moment, I was going to say if it were Canadian dollars, it'd be a real fucking debt. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, it's, it's just a bunch of savings accounts. You go to Chase and you say, I'm going to open a savings account here. And you put the money in there and they give you a receipt. And it says, oh, I have so much in my savings account. Similarly, you go to the government, you buy a bond, and they take your dollars and they ship them from a reserve account to a securities account which is a savings account. And guess what? It pays interest. Isn't that interesting? So <laughs> when we open a savings account at Chase, people say, is it paying interest? And you say, well, yes, it is. And you say, well, isn't that wonderful? That's financial responsibility for you. But when China does it, it's Armageddon and we're all going to die. It makes all sorts of sense. It's, it's a bunch of bullshit. We don't owe China. I mean, Let's get into the mechanics. Let's, let's get these people straight so that they understand how the national debt comes about, what it is, and how we eliminate the thing. Because, I'm, you know, the national debt's stupid. It doesn't exist. And we're going to prove it tonight. All right? So, <laughs> yeah. so 
Well, that coffee. So, well, we're, we, you're so, kind of in a frozen limbo there, sir. <laughs> can you hear me? I can At hear least. you fine, sir. I can't see you, but I can hear you. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. <laughs> when I come back, I come back. So um, let's go ahead and unwind the national debt, find out how it gets there, how we get a national debt, and how we eliminate this thing because it's not real. So we know it's savings accounts. That's what it is. Now let's explain how the savings accounts. Hit me with a question. Go on. So, so let's start with why are why are we sold that we are broke? Why why are the American people told that we're broke? What is the point of showing that clock spinning around? Why do people think that we're broke? That the United States is broke as hell and we can't spend any more? Why, why do they believe that? Tell me about that. Corporate welfare. What does that mean? What it means is. Treasury bonds are an archaic device that are no longer necessary when you have a fiat currency like we have. We have a free-floating inconvertible fiat currency. It's a flexible currency arrangement. Treasury bonds were necessary years and years ago during the gold standard, but they're not today. Years ago in the gold standard, we would use treasury bonds so that government could deficit spend while keeping the level of currency in circulation consistent with the gold supply. So it wouldn't run out of gold, you see. But when you take away that gold peg, you no longer have to borrow to deficit spend. You no longer have to tax to spend. You just spend. The bonds themselves, the go ahead, go ahead. Well, because we create the money, correct? Yeah. The US That's government. Right. The U.S. government is the monopoly issuer of U.S. dollars. It is the only place that you, you know how Apple is the monopoly issuer of iPads? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, well, the U.S. government is the monopoly issuer of the one product that everyone needs. So the U.S. government issues the dollars, and in any time it could short the, the economy of dollars, and if it does, unemployment will rise. Why? Because we all depend on dollars for our survival, you see. Well, you know, so you have these treasury bonds here that come in. They're a very old device. They're totally useless in the modern day. You say, well, what's a treasury bond anyway in a fiat system? Well, the only thing that it can do is two things. It can either drain off excess reserves, in other words, defend a positive target interest rate set by the central bank, or two, it can act as a savings account. In other words, a risk-free uh, investment that pays interest. The idea is, why do you need to issue them in the first place? Because since they're not funding for nothing whatsoever, if you're trying to defend a positive target rate, there are easier ways in more efficient ways. You could just have the Federal Reserve pay interest on reserves, and then you'd have to issue bonds. Or you can maintain a zero interest rate policy. You don't have to issue bonds. Bonds are an archaic thing. It's an anachronism. It's from the gold standard. See, way back here, beyond me, <laughs> way back here. And when the government goes and says, well, what we need to do is issue treasury bonds when we want a deficit spend, what it's basically saying is we want to create a bunch of savings accounts. And we want to increase the amount of savings account. So what are they for? And the answer is corporate welfare. Congress it demands that Treasury issue these bonds, which pay interest, mind you. And then businesses snap them up, you know, corporations, people snap them up. And basically what they're doing is they're using public funds to manage the risk rather than their own capital. Wait, hold on, stop right there. Stop right there. So what you're saying to me, because I want to make sure I'm hearing this correctly, is our tax dollars pay that in interest, right? We're paying interest. Our, our grandchildren ch are paying that interest for those loans, the, the corporate welfare, correct? No. 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 So, so, so how, how, how does that interest get paid? Uh, 
keyboard. It's one of these. Uh, don't know if you can see it there, but there's some numbers up here. And then the government types some numbers in a bank account, and then they just become dollars. That's how we do it. So, so, so our, our, our taxes aren't paying. We're not, we're not just living to pay for the interest to the Fed, right? That's not happening? So someone's wow. telling the lie out there, right? Paying interest to the Fed? How, how does that? The Fed is a central bank. The, the Federal Reserve, okay, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve is a U.S. government agency. It's an agency of the U.S. government. I don't care what anybody says. It doesn't matter what Peter Schiff or anybody else says. And second of all, the, the Federal Reserve returns profits to the U.S. Treasury. Okay? <laughs> this whole thing is ridiculous. Uh, this, I, I take it we're going on the privatization of the, the Fed. The Fed is a private entity, the Rothschilds thing, and, and, and we're beholden to it. Well, who else would the debt be to? No one. <laughs> I mean, the U.S. government issues the dollar... And then you get a hold of the dollars and you say, oh, I want to buy a bond. And the government says, okay, you can buy one. You say, here you are. And then you hold on to the bond and you say, oh, I have a bond. I have a bond. And your, your dollars transfer from a reserve account, from your bank's reserve account at the Fed to a savings account also at the Fed. Wow. And they sit there unspent earning interest. Ooh. Wow. And how did the dollars get there? Because the government at one time deficit spent them into the economy. So you could get a hold of them and buy the bond. So they're doing these bonds. And the, and the answer is to defend a positive target rate set by the Fed and to corporate welfare. Corporate welfare. They, these corporations will use those treasury bonds, which are public funds. You know, they'll use public funds to manage their risk rather than own capital. You see? So if you get rid of treasury bonds altogether, the bond market will start stomping its feet, you know, and it's going to, no, no, we don't have enough debt. We want debt. We want more debt. And, and then Congress says, okay, give them more debt. And then they get to play. So <laughs> that's really all it is. But um, functionally, it's just a savings account that pays interest. No different than your savings account, except this one's held at the Federal Reserve. You know, and the government types the interest out of thin air. You know, I hate using the term out of thin air, but that's what it does. It just goes into the bank account and it says, let there be $130. And there is, you know, and that's that. So when we print money to pay for bills and for, pay for entitlements and things like that, that doesn't increase our debt? We don't print money. <laughs> we just credit bank accounts. Oh, okay. I'm we sorry. Don't print money to fund. But I keep hearing people say, what are we going to do? Just print money? So I was just checking with you there, sir. No. No, the, the U.S. government doesn't print money to fund spending. That's a gold standard operation way back in the past, just like bonds. Um, cash has nothing to do with federal spending. Okay, Cash today is based on bank customer demand for cash. And during the holidays, especially, banks get overwhelmed because customers are saying, we want cash. And I say, okay. So they call up the Federal Reserve and say, we need, we need cash, damn it. Our customers demand cash. So the Federal Reserve, which is owned by the Rothschilds, <laughs> has to get some printed money. How does it do that? Well, first it contacts the U.S. Treasury's Bureau of Engraving and Printing and says, I need cash. And the Treasury, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing is the one that prints off the Federal Reserve notes. And they get shipped directly to one of the 12, you know, to the 12 reserve regions, which then end up at the banks and then the banks put them in their vault. But at the same time, if Chase were to say, well, Federal Reserve, I need $2 million in cash. The Federal Reserve will look at, it, at Chase's reserve account and see that it has enough there. And then it will delete the number $2 million from Chase's reserve account and ship 
two million dollars in cash, which will then be held in Chase's vault. Duh. It's not funding any spending. It's bank customers demand our dollars because Steve Grumbine demands them. If you don't want to see paper dollars, then stop demanding them, all right? I mean, God, <laughs> this is real simple. If, if the government wants to pay the interest on the national debt, it doesn't print anything. You know, like I was saying, Obama's just cranking, you know, China's coming for the rich check, Steve, and Obama just wearing out his arm, cranking that damn thing, cranking out the money. <laughs> no such thing is occurring. All that's happening is the Federal Reserve is moving some dollars back and forth and going up to a keyboard and type, 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 and that's it. They're just in, they're just increasing the numbers. If you have five thousand dollars in your bank account, Stephen, and the government gives you a thousand, they don't add. They just simply change the number five thousand to six thousand. That's it. So, they, so what you're telling me is there's a huge difference, a huge difference between the paper dollar that people know in their wallet and the actual dollars that are circulating amongst the banks, amongst business, et cetera. So electronic dollars are not the same as just the paper. What's the difference? They are I, the I don't same. understand. They are the same, but cash, cash does not come from federal. If, when, the, when a federal government spends, it doesn't have to print cash. That's silly. It issues a bunch of numbers. Like I said, it goes into a bank account somewhere, a reserve account, and it raises those numbers up. So like, like a, if the, let's say the federal government wants to give you a tax refund of $10,000. You're a very fortunate individual. It goes into your bank account and let's say you have $1,000. It simply ups the number 1,000 to the number 11,000. That's it. Now you have $11,000. If you want cash, <laughs> you have to contact your bank and go in there and make a withdrawal and they'll have the little bit of cash on hand and they'll give it to you. But the thing is, cash is a dollar, numbers in reserve accounts are dollars, and numbers in security accounts are dollars. It's just that the numbers in security accounts, called bonds, are dollars that pay interest. That's it. So, so dollars, the dollar, the US dollar, the US dollar takes cash, numbers in reserve accounts, and numbers in securities accounts. That's it. It can't come in any other form but those three. So why are we afraid of debt? Is that the right term even? Should we even be calling it the U.S. debt? No. What should we national, be calling it? National savings. National savings. So yes. what do you have to say to people who are afraid of this, that are petrified of it? I mean, it seems absolutely ridiculous that they would have any fear at all of this. Well, they must be afraid of the monster hiding under the bed, too. I mean, this is a stupid thing. Yeah, it's a bunch of savings accounts that pay interest. What are you afraid of? I mean, that's how very hypocritical, you know. And I've got something to say to people who have treasury bonds, too, by the way. Just one moment here. Yeah. Anyone, anyone out there, and I'm being very clear, any one of you out there, who own treasury bonds and then rail on the national debt are a bunch of hypocrites. Think about it. You have treasury bonds on the one hand and then you dare come and say, oh, we're all going to die at the same time. Well, you're contributing to the, to the demise of the U.S. government, aren't you? It's really silly. It's, this is, let's back up. Let's back up. The mainstream, the mainstream viewpoint, you will notice mainstream economics is nothing but a message of doom, Gloom and sacrifice, is it not? That's Absolutely. all there is. We're all going to die. Let's figure out how many people we need to crucify so that we can make sure everyone else survives. That's one hell of a science. <laughs> I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. It's just absolute stupidity. It's just, let's tell you what to be afraid of. Here's what you should be afraid of, the national debt. We're all going to die. Japan is the walking debt. Have you ever seen a debt to GDP of 280%? They're going to die. We're all going to die here. There are a bunch of savings accounts. So 
You go and you put your money in Chase, or you go and put your money in Bank of America, and you open a savings account, no one says, oh my God, how fucking irresponsible you are. <laughs> but you go and put a saving, put money in a savings account at the Federal Reserve, and it's Armageddon. You've got to check the book of Revelation in the Bible. Here it is. We're all going to die. You know, government spending is the drool of Satan. You know, drool. It's just toxic drool. It's all bullshit. It's a bunch of savings accounts that pay interest. And, and all of the dollars first came from the U.S. government to begin with. And then people got a hold of them. And they decided to buy bonds simply because the government was offering them. They said, okay, we'll take it and earn a little bit of interest. And you do that, millions of people do that every day at their own banks. Except what's the difference here? Chase can go broke, the U.S. government cannot. Eh? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to worry about. It can't go broke? So you mean, it's a I, lie. It's, it's a freaking lie is what you're telling me. Yeah, it's a lie. It's a flat out lie. There are people out there that say, well, it's not exactly a lie. It's just misunderstanding. I'm, I'm more of a belief that there's a nefarious intent behind it and a not conspiracy intent. I mean a nefarious intent to keep the public thinking that they, their government is going broke so that they can continue to funnel corporate welfare and funnel national income to the rich and make everyone else think that we're all going to die and we have to sacrifice. We've got to tighten our belt, damn it. The government's got to tighten its belt. The people tighten their belt and all this micro bullshit. Microeconomics is bullshit. Ain't got nothing to do with reality. It's calculating how many angels give a fuck. I just don't care. I just don't care. What I care about is starvation. I Amen. care about foreclosure. I care about people dying in sub-zero weather because they don't have any homes. And why is this happening to them? Because they are told persistently that the market is in charge. The market is a god. They're persistently told that China is loaning money to a broke U.S. government. The absurdity of such a statement, it, it, it's mind-boggling to me. China is loaning money to the broke U.S. government. That's interesting. So what you're telling me is China, knowing the military might of the U.S., is willing to lend the broke U.S. government money, knowing full well that it is going to only expand the size of its military with China's money. Yeah. I would say that everyone in China is kind of a little bit off. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anyone who would <laughs> do that. Russia. Oh, yes, Russia. Russia buys some bonds, so they're loaning the U.S. government money. That makes a lot of sense, knowing full well they're going to use Russia's money to expand that military. Russia would have to be insane to do something like this. It's just absolutely stupid on the surface, on the whole, around. It's dumb. Nobody's loaning us anything. It's just but, stupid. But if we spend more money into our economy, Ellis, won't that devalue it? Doesn't that devalue our currency, Ellis? No. Because every single time, and I'm going to be clear so that people understand me. Every federal government runs a deficit. It is increasing the number of dollars in circulation. End of story. So where's your hyperinflation? Because we've been doing this for 40 fucking years. <laughs> so, I mean, I, unfortunately, you know, we've got, you know, 101 people watching right now. And there's 350 million people in the United States, mm -hmm. most of which are absolutely and utterly economic illiterati and most of them quite frankly peddle the same wicked destructive myths about debt and deficits and therefore are rendering our nation weak and impotent to meet the needs of its people mm -hmm. and are therefore in my estimation economic terrorists and we're about to, we're, I think I, we've talked about this last time, but I want to bring it up again because I want to make sure people understand this. The GOP is one state house away right now from being able to call a constitutional convention. Mm -hmm. A constitutional convention where they have broad bipartisan support <laughs> for a balanced budget amendment. 
which would absolutely be economic terrorism and destroy our national sovereignty. Can you please speak to that, Ellis? Yes, I can. A balanced budget amendment is economic suicide. The reason why it's suicide is because the only place the market can get U.S. dollars is from the U.S. government deficit spending. This is not a hard thing for these idiots to understand. If the government is the sole monopoly supplier of U.S. dollars, it must spend. It has to do this. It has to run deficits in order to add more dollars to the economy. So if you want to run a balanced budget, what that basically says is over here you have government spending and over here you have government taxation. So G always equals T. In other words, if the government is always spending, say, $4 trillion and then always taxing away $4 trillion, it's not adding anything to the U.S. economy. So there can be no job additions. There can be no additions of jobs. There can be no economic growth. There can be nothing except a smoking crater of a dead economy. A total, you would be, you would literally be having a constitutional convention to decide to slit the American people's throat. That's what you're doing. You're deciding to, to have a depression permanently. Let's just have a depression permanently. Yee-hoo! I mean, what kind of stupid nonsense is that? But Ellis, I have to balance my checkbook every month. Why shouldn't the federal government balance its checkbook too? Because you, Stephen, are a user of the federal government's currency. You use U.S. dollars. So because you're a user, you are not allowed to issue them. But the issuer is not constrained in this way. It, its budget is nothing like a household at all, at all. In fact, I hate the word budget. I've been at this for years. We really need to stop calling the federal budget a budget. It needs to be called the fiscal agenda because every time Congress sits down on its ass and says, what are we going to spend money for this year? What it's really doing is trying to decide what it's going to fund. In other words, an agenda. What it's going to do to the U.S. economy. What shall we do to the economy this year is what they're asking. And then they say, well, we've decided to do this to the economy. The president says, I like that. Signs it. Then it becomes reality. Whatever happens to the economy now happens because Congress has decided that will be the agenda this year. So what's the agenda? What's been the agenda since new Democrats came along? Poverty. High mm -hmm. private debt. High private debt levels. Wage suppression. That's been the fiscal agenda every single year. Let's crush down the 99% and, and, and worship uh, the, the, the middle class. Uh, well, you know, the middle class, they're just awesome. Uh, middle class have more discretionary income. If they don't have more discretionary income, then rich people. Eh? <laughs> I mean, it's just stupid. It's stupid. No, I refuse. Let, let's talk for a second because, you know, getting out of my Joe Q public for a minute, let's talk yeah. about the sequestration, the debt limits, discussions, and so forth. So what I'm hearing from you based on our conversation, when they talk about raising the debt limit, are they talking about so they can sell more treasury bonds? What are they talking about? Because you spend so much on welfare and, and, and all kinds of other such things like Obama phones. What, what exactly is that? What, is, what makes up the debt limit? What, what are we talking about there? For the easiest way for, for your viewers to understand what the debt ceiling is, is to explain it this way. The debt ceiling is a political tool designed to strong arm the opposition into cuts to social programs. That's it. Under the guise that we need to find financing for federal spending. So the American people look at it and say, oh, God, we've hit a fiscal cliff. We're all going to die. And then Congress noticed they start screaming and yelling at one another. 
and one side will try and strong arm the other side with cuts under the guys that will shut this damn government down if we don't get our cuts to Social Security and Medicare and SNAP. That's another one. If damn moochers are on that, they got to be cut down. Or we're going to shut the government down. Ask Mr. Gingrich. So then the Democrats, they go spineless and go, okay, just don't hurt me, sir. Don't hit me again. Don't, don't, here's my lunch money. <laughs> and then guess what happens? Everything goes back to normal. Look, folks, listen to me. Listen to me. The national debt is over 100, well over 170 years old. Okay? Well over 170 years old. At some point in time, we're going to have to come to the realization and understanding that maybe it's not a problem. How many businesses have carried an enormous debt for 170 years and not gone broke? How many businesses and households do you know that can persistently for 170 years? Think about it, okay? This is all bullshit. It's <laughs> bullshit. You so, know, it's not a conspiracy. It's just bullshit. But, but in, but what happened in, in 1913? Though you, we, we, it became something serious. We all of a sudden we, we, we we're in this tough situation now because because of the creature of Jekyll Isle and creating the Federal Reserve. What, 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 what? what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about it? That's a, that's a pleasant fiction. It's a great campfire story, but it has nothing to do with anything. It's fake. It doesn't matter what the Federal Reserve did, what Woodrow Wilson said 8,000 years ago. What matters is what the Federal Reserve is doing now. The Board of Governors is an agency of the federal government. The Federal Reserve is the nation's central bank. U.S. government. Now, you got a bunch of Commercial banks down here, see them, Stephen? Down here's Chase, and over here's Bank of America. Okay. They attach themselves. Let's see if we can figure out why. Maybe it's because when Stephen swipes a debit card, we want to ensure that the payment will clear. Duh. I mean, the federal, the central bank stands ready to inject reserves into reserve accounts. And the banks use the reserve accounts to ensure that payments clear. And because the commercial banks are attached to the government, the central bank, the central bank can conduct monetary policy and it can influence the, the level of reserves. You know, just because Chase, JP Morgan Chase is attached to the Federal Reserve, it attaches itself to the central bank, does not imply ownership. Look, I'll explain it to you this way. Power company. You got a power company, okay? Power company is attached to your house by a bunch of wires and it goes up to your house. So you're attached to the power grid. Are you not? Yes. Okay. So you get electricity from the power company because you're attached directly to the power grid, which is controlled by the power company. Now, so what we're saying then is if the Federal Reserve is owned by a private bank just because a commercial bank attaches itself to the central bank, that's the same thing as saying that you are the owner of the power company because your house is attached to the power grid. It's absolutely absurd. It doesn't imply ownership whatsoever. The Federal Reserve itself is, a, is an agency of the federal government. That's it. End of story. Commercial banks have to, they, they attach themselves to it and the payment system operates. We have a thing in this country, it's called the banking system, in case you didn't notice. You know, I mean, you need to, you have the central bank. So that, you know, they want to get rid of the central bank. We've got to end the Fed. End the Fed. We've got to end the Fed for the, the gray aliens coming down to each lab. Lizard okay, people. <laughs> so let's pretend that we end the Fed. Now it's gone. There it is. Fed's gone. Everyone's happy. We'll let the U.S. Treasury take over. Do its job the way it was meant to be done. Now here comes J.P. Morgan Chase attaching itself to the U.S. Treasury. Here comes Bank of America attaching itself to the U.S. Treasury. And the U.S. Treasury is doing the job that the Federal Reserve used to do. So what are we saying? The U.S. Treasury is now private. It's a private treasury. Give me a frigging break. It's just a bank. It's a gigantic bank that was created by the U.S. government and commercial banks attached themselves to it so that the payment system will operate. 
and so the central bank can conduct monetary policy. What is this? Is it's it's ridiculous when the U.S. when Congress says I'm spending four trillion dollars, and that's it, damn it, four trillion, and the president says, "All right, let's spend the four trillion." The moment that has been agreed upon, four trillion new dollars have been manufactured, and they're awaiting disbursement. At which trade and the Federal Reserve, which is the bank now, it's the government bank, comes together, and they ensure that the payments will friggin' clear. They work together to make sure that you can actually get your damn money. God, I mean, this is just so stupid. Do you really believe if the Federal Reserve was owned by the Rothschilds that the Federal Reserve would even be allowed to give you a dollar? No, they'd be pumping it to the fucking Rothschilds. All of it would be going to the Rothschilds. <laughs> I mean, Clay, I'm going next time we talk about this. I'm getting one of those gray, you know, those aliens who's you know from. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, close encounters of the third kind. I'm getting it with the little eyes, you know, and I'm just going to sit there with the fingers and little light, little ET phone home. Oh, I own the Federal Reserve. You know, I mean, this is stupid. And you know what this is? This is absolute asinine bullshit that is only creating obstruction to progress. It's an, it's an obstruction to progress. Man. And these people think they're actually doing us a favor by exposing what's really happening is they're contributing to privation. They're contributing to suffering. They're contributing to needless suffering. It's just stupid. I don't know why it really matters that the Rothschilds own the Federal Reserve to them. But <laughs> Xanax, like I said, last time we talked about Xanax, it'll be okay. Shut the fuck up. Okay, <laughs> sit down. <the> fuck up. <laughs> oh, my. So... Let, let me ask you another question real quick, because this is this came up today and I think it's worth asking, asking a real economist besides just Stevie G. Right. So let's let's go here. Somebody okay. tried to say that the stuff I am peddling is mere right wing, you know, Trojan horse right out of the Heritage Foundation and that I'm preaching things because. Because you know that's that's what we do. That that that's what this is all about. Is is just more Reaganomics bullshit. MMT is Reaganomics. That's that what, what he's, he's, guys, he's basically out there saying. This is all right wing nonsense. Um. Okay. Well, I guess we should start here. And explain to your listeners or your viewers, I, I should say, what MMT really is. All MMT is, mon is, is monetary analysis, or what we call currency analysis. It just analyzes how a currency operates, and that's that. doesn't do anything else. It just says, okay, well, this is how currency operates in, in the United States, and Australia, and the UK. The thing is, though, is that MMT doesn't just describe, um, and I've seen this before, so I want to correct this. MMT doesn't just describe the world post-1971. It also describes the gold standard. It also describes the European Monetary Union and how that works. Wherever there is money, wherever there's a monetary economy, MMT describes it and the story. Okay? So with that, it's not a policy. It only implies policy. It just is. MMT just is. This is the way things are. It's a description. You, you can derive policy from it. But it's apolitical. It's just currency analysis. It's not a vast right-wing conspiracy <laughs> from the fucking Heritage Foundation. <laughs> what the fuck is that shit? Um, <clears throat> when's the last time the Heritage Foundation said, you know, federal taxes don't fund federal spend, national debt not a real debt, and... Uh, we can have universal health care anytime we want <laughs> because that's what MMT implies. Okay. I and think what they're getting at, Ellis, is that because I'm saying taxes don't fund spending, uh, I'm also tipping my hat saying, hey, we could actually cut taxes for stimulus to impact the economy as well. And that's not Democrat at all because the Democrats will march in place fighting for raising taxes at all costs 
because we've got to fund something. No, no. The, you can cut taxes, which will then take the pressure off of consumer savings, allowing consumers to spend more. A lot of these idiots don't have any clue, especially Democrats. They don't have any clue how jobs are added to the economy, how business adds jobs. They think that business is in charge, and it's ridiculous. Consumers are in charge. If we ignore the federal government for just a moment, consumers are in charge. Consumers get a hold of a dollar, they spend it. That becomes income for the business. Now, if consumers on aggregate, which means all consumers, increase their spending, this places pressure on business to increase its production. And in order to, the only way it can increase its production to meet that demand is it has to hire more workers. Okay, <laughs> so there's that. Now, if you've got a shit ton of consumers who are poor and they're being taxed to death, like FICA, for instance, what it's doing is the FICA tax is suppressing their ability to spend. It's reducing their spending power. If you eliminate the FICA tax to suspend it, then consumers have more money to spend. So, yes, if they have more money to spend and they spend, then more jobs are going to be created because business income goes up along with the pressure to increase production. So, you know, business hires more. There's nothing Reaganomics about that. Reaganomics says that business is Jesus. And we worship at the foot of a business and government has to give handouts. I hate that word. Government has to create dollars and give them the business. And it also has to provide tax cuts to business as an incentive to create more jobs. Okay, that's Reaganomics. Okay, that's supply side theory. That's nutball theory. That's jack wagonry. Okay, reality is, is consumers, if you ignore government for just a moment, consumers are the job creators, they either increase production or decrease production. And if it increases, jobs go up. And if it decreases production, jobs go down. But it's because of consumer behavior, okay? Now, if you add back in the currency issuer, the federal government, the federal government deficit spends, adding more dollars into the economy. Consumers spend more, jobs are in, you know, unemployment drops. Isn't that wonderful? That tells you that the federal government controls the unemployment rate, not the fucking market. So when these Democrats are marching in place and they're saying, oh, we've got to raise taxes on the rich to pay for this. And, oh, he, Grumbine said that he was going to cut taxes. Well, that's Reaganomics, this trickle-down theory. No, no, no. Obama's middle class out is trickle-down theory. <laughs> MMT is not trickle-down anything. It's just currency analysis. And it suggests that if you cut taxes on the working class and middle class, they will increase their spending and more jobs will be created. Duh! I mean... Ellis, you're gonna love this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a question. It's not really a question, but this is the kind of stupidity that uh, hits me on a daily basis from the friggin' people that are supposedly out there working for a green economy, working for a friggin' single payer, working to make all these wonderful progressive laws come to play. I'm going to read this out loud for our audience and I'm going to give attribution because the person felt so swaggery to saunter in and say this bunch of bullshit. I'm going to read it and give them all the creds. So Bob Wyland, Ellis is full of shit. The Fed is not part of our gov and is an entity owned and run by banks. Do some history in the early part of the 20th century. The U.S. ended its gold standard and gave the banks control of the Fed, and it was the start of the fiat system. These documents were signed by Wilson along with the initiation of the IRS bill. And yes, our taxes do go to pay off the interest that the Fed charges for the money borrowed to keep us afloat. Yes, this is from Bob Weiland, super economist extraordinaire, who also says he's part of the Green Party, which, by the way, would mean that everything that the Green Party wants to do would not happen because of dear Bob. Go for it, sir. How do you respond? Up above my television is a thing that says, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> fairy tale, Bob. It's a fairy tale. Bob has no work experience with Treasury or 
in connection with the Federal Reserve. Bob has a lot of TV watching and reading experience from other people who have TV watching and reading experience. Bob doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. www.federalreserve.fucking.gov, Bob. <laughs> Federal Reserve <laughs> is a government agency. The Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., Bob, is an agency of the federal government. How hard does this have to be? Apparently, it has to be really hard. We've got to believe that the Federal Reserve is private and all our tax dollars are going to the Fed. The only fucking problem with that theory is that our tax dollars are going nowhere except in the shit can. They get flushed and the government says, bye now. And bye. <laughs> the federal, the, the, all your federal tax dollars are destroyed. End of story. They disappear from the banking system entirely. Even the Federal Reserve admits fully the Board of Governors is a federal agency. I mean, Bob is an obstructionist. Absolutely. And all I, all I will say is this. All I will say is that he's a very unlearned obstructionist. So all I will say is this. If this... Green Party as a whole thinks, which I don't think it is, but if this were the position of the Green Party itself, the Green Party is about as useless as the Republican Party. I'm, I, I've, I've made it very clear, just so we're on the same page, that I will never give my heart and soul to another party again until, and this is maybe never, right, until someone actually steps up and speaks truth about the economy. I am tired of liars. I'm tired of people that peddle fake myths. I'm tired of people that go around making us take crumbs. I'm tired of people faking and lying like they are somehow or another progressive. But the reality is they're too busy hunting the Rothschilds. They belong on some Bravo TV network ch chasing ghosts, chase the Rothschilds. They can have all their friggin' masks. They can do whatever they want. They can go out there and talk about the dinar. They can talk about whatever they want to. They can keep throwing up different, different like bullshit and just always some bullshit. At the end of the day, I want single payer now. I want the environment fixed before it's uninhabitable on this earth. Mm -hmm. I want to really, really make sure my kids don't have to pay an environmental debt that we can't back up, unlike our debt that we print etc. Or that we just keystroke into existence. I'm so disgusted, disgusted with the progressives of my movement, our movement, that sit there and peddle this stuff that is literally the antithesis of every single possible thing that we want to achieve. Every single thing we want to achieve, they are literally, literally kneecapping us. Right. Yes. The the thing is, I hate to say this, but I'll say it again because I say it all the time. Do not accept macroeconomic reality. You're not progressive. You're just left. That's it. You're not progressive. You're probably liberal, if anything. You cannot consider yourself progressive and hold on to this outdated, ridiculous dogma peddled by the Church of Orthodoxy. It's all market-based bullshit. I, I don't know how else to explain it except to say market-based bullshit because it is. Everything that this uh, guy that you mentioned, Bob, everything that he wants is attainable like that. Why doesn't he want to go get it? We can do it right now. Why does he not want to go get it? Why does he want to bother creating some ridiculous theoretical nightmare? about how the Fed is private and our tax dollars are going. Why would you want to believe in something like that? That is the message of no hope. That is the message of doom. I mean, does, do these people want to go into the streets with pitchforks? Why do you want to do that when you could easily just go in the voting booth and say, get the fuck out? I mm. mean, seriously. It is just that simple. You I mean, I have the point right now for myself that – if the Green Party doesn't come out of the woodwork and start speaking boldly about economics, 
yeah. I can't support them long term either. If they're going to sit there and talk about this stuff like we're like such struggling souls, struggling to find a, a, a dollar, you know, under a, a heat grate or something like that. Oh, my goodness. I found a quarter federal government. Now we can go ahead and what? I mean, they're talking about literally making us energy independent on green energy in like, you know, 30 years. How in the world would they do such a thing without massive, massive? federal deficit spending. I mean, we're talking about everything that the ten of them are talking about. The, the pie in the sky shit that they keep talking about is completely undoable without us doing what we're talking about here. And it makes no sense to me why we can't get our own kind waking up, smelling the coffee and stop stealing, stealing defeat from the jaws of victory. I don't get it. Ellis, help me out. Um, some people, just your average person, seems to be more comfortable with the notion of believing that there is no hope, and they want vengeance. They want to attach. They want to. They want to attack the rich and tax the rich into the ground for vengeance. But the problem is, you're going to create better equity, yes, but you're just going to make everyone poorer. The U.S. government does not play Robin Hood. It's not possible. It is not possible for the United, the government of the United Kingdom to play Robin Hood. It is not possible for the government of Canada to play Robin Hood. It is not possible for the government of Australia to play Robin Hood because none of the national government's taxation efforts will ever go to fund federal spending. It just doesn't work that way. If you're going to tax the rich, you need to be doing something else. These are two separate operations. Spending is a separate operation from taxation. Spending comes first, taxation comes after. So what we're doing is we need to be spending now. We need to spend now. We need to go out now and we need to spend for universal health care. We need to spend for tuition-free college education. We need to spend to reduce the private debt level. We need to spend for infrastructure modernization, high-speed rail, and solar roads. We need to ensure that there is a job for everyone who wants a job at a decent wage. Once these things are complete, you can then turn to the rich if it's absolutely necessary and say, now about that hoard of dollars. What is more important to you? Ending hunger, ending privation, ending unemployment forever, ending suffering forever, or sitting around and waiting until you can exact revenge on people you don't know. I mean, that is the entire mantra of, 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 of the left and the so-called progressive movement is tax the rich. I mean, you can write a song, woo-hoo, go and tax the rich, woo-hoo, anything, anything, any, any single item on the agenda, whether it be universal health care, whether it would be College, you can't have a job guarantee. Hey, don't pay for it. We have more tax rate. Well, that's really simple macroeconomics for you. It's amazing anyone has to go to college. It's just tax rate. Where the hell? You, you can't do that anymore. It doesn't work that way. All you will do is reduce the rich people's wealth, but nothing else. You will achieve nothing else because the spending could take place whether we tax them or not. So if I'm telling you that we can have everything we want if we just start spending now, and we're not going to go broke, and we're not going to have hyperinflation if we do it. Do it. Just go out and do it. End the suffering now. If you're really a progressive, go out there and end the suffering now. And then deal with the rich later if it's absolutely necessary. But right now, it's not. It's just not. We need to get going. We need to actually do something. So let's the richest. I want to tee up what you're saying right now for our next week's interview when we work together on Sundays. Folks, just so you know, this is going to be a regular spot with Ellis. He's agreed to work with us Sunday nights at 8 p.m. We would have done it last night, but obviously with Christmas being Christmas, we decided to give everybody a little bit of a break. Um, that said, next week we're talking about income inequality yeah. and how it is like the single greatest threat to our democracy, if you will, to our existence um, as a nation. And uh, Ellis will be entering into that. And obviously, most of you think that taxing the rich is a key element to that. I would offer up that that's probably not the key to that. And I think Ellis would agree with me. Um, so with that, 
Tune in to us next Sunday night at 8 p.m. and we'll have more Ellis. Um, but Ellis, I want to give you the parting shot. We're coming up on the hour here. What do you got to say to our fans and audience, et cetera? What, what, what message do you want to leave them with to close this out? I want to leave this with you guys to think about. <clears throat> the political spectrum that we've been talking about, progressive conservatives, it's all a fiction. It's a fantasy. It's based on economic nonsense. You can call ourselves progressive. But once we understand how currency works and vacate the political spectrum entirely, people ask me all the time, so what are you, progressive, you conservative? I tell them, no, I'm above. And I mean that literally. I've risen above the political spectrum. Because what you understand is that when you, when you fully, when the light bulb is on and you fully understand MMT, you understand those fundamental basics, and you vacate that, you realize that being progressive is just normal. I'm not progressive, I'm just normal. <laughs> because the government can fund anything. So in reality, those of us who are progressive and understand what's going on with our currency aren't progressive at all. We're just normal people. We're just normal. Everyone else is delusional. You know? So be thankful you're not delusional. <laughs> all right? Be glad you are awake, as they call it. And as far as concerned, politicians are not to be idolized. They are to be commanded. From the moment you vote for them, throughout their entire term, until their term ends, you are to command them 24-7. Never let your servant be your master. A politician is your servant. Treat them as such. That's it. Never view them as political leaders because they are not leaders. If you tell them they are leaders and you think that they are leaders, they will lead you. And where they lead you, you may not want to go. Very good. Ellis, I'm sorry, I'm breaking protocol. I see one more question from one of our uh, contributors, Laura Hamilton, and this is a really good question. It's one that I think a lot of people were questioning uh, with Bernie Sanders running and Stephanie Kelton guiding him and others. And she says, my question is the fact that this is not, not widely known because of volition or ignorance, who mm -hmm. actually does understand that can make decisions in our government? Maybe a combination of both, but I'd like to know where we need to apply the pressure. Great question, Laura. Mm -hmm. The pressure needs to be applied on the politicians that are currently sitting. And how we do that and the only real way this can be done is by educating the public and ignoring people who don't want to hear about it. As we get more and more people understanding, there's a snowball effect. You gain momentum. And then that momentum becomes undeniable. And then there is a meeting point. A line is drawn in the sand. And we say, let's go. And so it will be orthodoxy versus us. We will fight it out right there. And the more people that come along, the more pressure will be applied. And it will be simple. You either get with macroeconomic reality or you get the fuck out. We are the only, the U.S. citizen is the only person that has the authority here. You treat, this goes back to what I said, you treat politicians not as leaders. You treat them as servants. And if they refuse to reduce themselves to servantile position, then you throw them out on their ass. This is yeah. our house. They chose this job. They wanted to become a politician. They knew the job description. You are a public servant. Do not act like a leader because you lead nothing. The American people will lead. It is our house. You will do what we put you there to do. And if you don't, you can fuck off. <laughs> That's simple. And, and people will ask me, let me say one thing. People will ask me about, I, I've been asked before, if Bernie Sanders has been advised by Stephanie Kelton, brilliant woman, brilliant economist, how come he keeps saying tax the rich, tax the rich? Scott Fulweiler summarized this beautifully on Twitter once. He said he was talking to some guy, I don't remember the guy's name, but he said, it's people like you 
who have made politically unacceptable. And that's why. To get out there and start saying these things, people will say, oh, well, that's politically unacceptable. They, you know how they, they call you a nut. They call you a fruitcake and all this other stuff, and they berate you in the media, you know? And so, you know, that's the answer to that. And what we need to do is we need to make MMT politically acceptable. And that's what we do. That's why I do what I do. That's what other people do what they do. And that's why you're doing what you do there, Stephen, to make, to change the economic narrative to where reality has become acceptable. <laughs> that, you, no, what you just said there, I'm sorry, that was so profound. This is, we are not bringing MMT to the world. MMT mm -hmm. is here. The That's issue is there. not whether it's here or not. The issue is how does our public servants execute it? Mm -hmm. And right now, not very well. Not very right. well. All right. Well, so you're using that, it in the complete. Ellis, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this broadcast off. Folks, I want to thank every one of you for joining us yet again. Please tune in tomorrow night. I'll have uh, Tim Canova with me. We'll be talking about Progress for All, and we'll be talking about his opportunity to take down Debbie What's-Her-Name Schultz next time. Have a great night, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. This is Steve with Real Progressives. Ellis, thank you so much, sir. We're out of here.